Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another of our In Conversation Live from the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm Roger Kirby, and I have to say I love doing these shows. And uh, tonight we've got uh, a special guest um, from the Royal Navy, Rear Admiral Andy Kite. Andy, are you there? Say hello to us. Uh, rather than me tell you all about Andy, I think we'll get him to uh, tell you himself. Andy, you're based at the MOD now, but you've been in Afghanistan and Northern Ireland and you've been all over the place. So let's start by you telling us what you're doing now in, in the MOD. Uh, thanks, Roger, and a very good evening to you and, and everybody else. Uh, so, yeah, as, as, as you said, uh, Rear Admiral, uh, done 34 years now in the Royal Navy, which uh, uh, it was certainly not what I intended to do when I joined, uh, walked through the gates of Dartmouth in, in 1987. So uh, it's been a pretty uh, amazing career, seeing, seeing the whole world, um, Far East, Africa, uh, been to the North Pole, uh, America, and uh, lots of time in the Middle East, as, as, as you can probably imagine. Um, and right now I'm serving in the Ministry of Defence and I do two jobs. I'm the Assistant Chief of Defence Staff for effectively logistics. So I'm the senior uh, logistician in the Ministry of Defence. And I'm also the Chief Naval Logistics Officer uh, for the Royal Navy. And right now, I, I guess we're um, unsurprisingly uh, fixed by the crisis in, 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 in Ukraine and looking at uh, potential options, all of which are in, in the open source press that uh, the Prime Minister announced in the last week. So. That's what's keeping me busy. Um, thankfully, uh, I got away early tonight to come and join you. So I had to leave all the team behind doing all the planning so that I could come and speak to you tonight. Great. Well, uh, I'm sure we'll get some questions in from the audience. I think we've got 450 people signed up uh, this evening. And hello to uh, all of you. You're very welcome, all of you. Um, Andy, so, I mean, you mentioned the word logistics. And um, let, let's talk a bit about the Navy and uh, COVID and logistics, because, you know, we had all the folks out on their doorsteps clapping the NHS dur during the COVID pandemic. But I think, you know, what we don't really understand is, is or know so much about is, is how you guys in the, in the military supported the uh, COVID pandemic response logistically. So yeah, just talk us through that, that. How did that happen? What were the kind of key, key points? Mm. Um, over to you. Yeah, certainly, Rogers. So, so I think it's it, it's it's something that's not always well understood. The way in which the Ministry of Defence and and uh, the armed forces support the sort of civil authority in, in lots and lots of different ways. So, you, you everybody will be familiar with uh, military personnel helping out in floods and uh, and and, and na natural disasters like that. And obviously, quite recently, we've been doing uh, uh, fuel tanker driving and and and, and such like. Um, and, and on this occasion, um, when the pandemic started to become a thing in March of uh, 2020, um, it was quite obvious, um, fairly quickly, in fact, that there were going to be all kinds of different areas where the civil authority, other government departments effectively, were going to require assistance. And, and I think that was born as much as a result of the sort of, well, it's an overused phrase, but it was an unprecedented crisis. Um, and it just generated so many different um, challenges for, for government, um, not, not just in Westminster, but also in the devolved administrations. And I think that's where the military can then lean in and, and support with whether that's command and control, whether that's planning, whether that is logisticians, medics, engineers, all of whom found all of us found ourselves uh, helping out. I guess over, over the period of the pandemic, there's probably four areas we were, where we were most um, engaged. One was on the, the classic PPE, um, where we were em, em, embedded um, with a guy called Phil Prosser, who, who, who was um, an army brigadier. Uh, and we were embedded into uh, Skipton House um, down in uh, South London, um, effectively helping uh, NHS England reset the supply chain to meet the unprecedented demand for, for PPE. And we were also assisting then with um, the, the whole modelling of how much PPE we thought we would need uh, and, and, and how we would get it, where we would get it from, how we could move it, how we could meet the demand um, and how, in many respects, the demand was really not very well understood. So um, trying to generate the picture of where PPE was in most short supply and then being able to target what PPE there was 
in, in a way in which it met the urgency of need. And, and as many of, of your uh, colleagues will be aware, at times that, that PPE supply was pretty, um, was pretty bad. Um, we also got involved in, in flying around the world to collect PPE. Um, the famous Turkish PPE collection uh, mission was MIME, um, which um, in hindsight was, wasn't was the greatest uh, achievement because it turned out that all of the PPE was substandard and couldn't be used anyway. But at the time, it was literally about just trying to get whatever PPE you could. And so we were heavily uh, involved in that. Um, we did a lot of work. Uh, uh, you, you may recall something called the ventilator challenge, which was where industry was asked to try and uh, produced ventilators to, to again mitigate, mitigate against the really short supply of, of ventilators there was in the country. So we got heavily involved in that, working with uh, all, all kinds of different um, uh, companies, tech, tech, tech companies and engineering companies that were trying to help. And then we were involved in the sort of storage and distribution of that. Um, clearly then there was the Nightingale Hospitals where we were assisting with the mainly with the design and to some extent with the with the uh, equipping and building of them. So that was another big area. And then I think the final one, which um, it's sort of much later on in the pandemic, is vaccine distribution, um, particularly the distribution of vaccines to um, British overseas territories. So to places like Cayman Islands, to the Falklands, um, probably um, the most challenging one of all was to a little island down in the South Atlantic called Tristan de Kuna which um, bearing in mind, we, you have to um, distribute these vaccines in cold boxes. And it took, I think, two aircraft and two ships to get about 50 vaccines down to Tristan de Kuna. That was probably the most logistically challenging of all the vaccine distributions. But right across the spectrum of activity, defence was, was doing its thing. And of course, our medics, our doctors, our nurses um, were all um, where we could. Um, were, were embedded into um, the, the NHS in, in various parts of it. Great. And then uh, one question from me, I've got a couple of questions coming through, so I will get to those, I promise, very soon. Um, the, uh, the logistics organisation, there's the MOD, there's NHS England, you mentioned, and also the Cabinet Office was very much involved in this, wasn't it? I mean, the decisions about how much to pay I think Kate Bingham was in, who's been on our show actually uh, a, few, a few months ago, um, about how much they would pay for the vaccines and how much they would pay for the PPE. And of course, that's controversial um, now, and the people are asking questions about all of that. But how how did you coordinate? You know, I mean, who made the final decision? Was it the Cabinet Office? Was it MOD? Was it NHS England? And how, I mean, that's kind of un precedented the three organizations like that all working together to deal yeah. with the crisis yeah yeah so, uh, so, so i so i think the, the word <clears throat> the, the word unprecedented is is overused but it but it was genuinely that what was felt by by us um i think one of the biggest challenges in all of this was relationships because the, the relationships that you needed and you you've just touched on a couple of government departments but you then add in the foreign commonwealth office the department for trade bays were in there and and and, and but before you know it you've got a real um network of of relationships that you've got to develop and we we didn't have those in place because no one had expected such a crisis no one had expected a pandemic to be uh you know wrongly we should have done but we didn't um and as a result we had to create those relationships from from scratch and so that becomes a challenge um you also then find when you're when you're giving military support in this sense, there's some very clear um, legislation that, that governs the way in which the military can support civil authorities and other government departments. First is it doesn't come free. And a lot of people think it does, but it doesn't. We, we absolutely have to charge for what we do, which seems a little bit odd, but that's that's government accounting rules. But we are very much the supporting um, organization. So we don't lead, we don't make the decisions, we advise. Um, so um, anything on PPE, anything on ventilators, anything on vaccines or Nightingale hospitals, we are asked to advise, we provide that advice, but we don't at any stage have the executive authority to make the decisions. And that's quite a, that's quite a difficult set of circumstances, sometimes for the military, to be in um, because it's very easy for us to sort of step into an environment like that and be 
and be full of hubris and be full of, well, we know best and all the rest of it. Often you, you, you are into a very, very um, alien environment. And, and what you've got to be, you've got to be humble and you've got to be very, uh, you've got to listen. Uh, and then you've got to build those, those working relationships and you've got to build trust. That takes time. Uh, and 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 there's no um, there's no alternative but to invest that that time and that, that those personal relationships, but but for some in the military it can be a little bit along the lines of well hold on a minute we're in charge it or no you're not you're you're playing second fiddle if you like yeah there's a question from David Lawrence thanks David and then I come on to Mark Lodge's question which um, is, is up there as well David says army colleagues have talked about overstretching in their service do you feel the navy is in the same position especially when governments talk about uh, global Britain, what, what would you say? I mean, not just in relation to COVID, but I guess COVID would have, would have added to the overstretch. But that, that's a good question. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, it is a good question. And, it, and I think it's something that is um, frequently uh, at the forefront of the sort of at, at the strategic level and, and the conversations. Um, I think what has changed over, and I think if you go back, certainly, you go back to the, the days of when we were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan at the same time, that was a time at which what's called, the, the, so there are a set of defence planning assumptions, which um, is, is what government wants the military to be able to do. So it sets the, the tempo, the concurrency, um, the scale and range of what it should do. Certainly during that period, 2000 and, let's say 2003 to 2010, we were way above those defense planning assumptions. Um, and it was a hugely challenging period for defense in order to deliver uh, two, two campaigns, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. I think since then, um, and over time, it hasn't happened immediately, but, it's, but it is over time, we have got better at balancing um, resource and output, supply and demand. Um, now, you will always, I think, get to the position where government will want to do more than it is um, resourcing you for. Um, but it is the job of us in the Ministry of Defence to be very clear with ministers uh, and officials that um, if you want to go beyond defence planning assumptions, then that comes with risk. Now, you, you, you can't in, 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 a, in an operational sense, you are always going, you are never going to have enough. And I don't think any organisation, whether that's the NHS or, or the Ministry of Defence or, or, or whatever, particularly in the public sector, you'll never have enough resource to do everything you want to do. But it is then about the, an, the analysis, the identification of risk, and then you can determine how you go forward. So, you know, you might determine that the scale of effort for a particular operation will be scaled back, or you might decide that it is only for three months you're going to do that operation, not six, or you might decide that actually you're going to play quite a low role in this operation and leave more complex stuff to your allies and partners. So I, so I, would, I would absolutely recognise the term overstretch, um, and, it, and it goes in sort of peaks and troughs of time. Um, but I think we're now at a stage in a mu much more transparent way where we can have those conversations. And I think we also have to pay, you know, um, credit to this government who has at last, I think, resort is, is resourcing defence to, to, the, to the sort of tune of, the, of money that it needs to do. So I think there is there, there's much more work to be done, but, but balancing the amount of money we've got against the global ambition that the that the, the government has put for, for the military, I think is as probably balanced as I've ever seen it. That's good. Matt Carey, thanks, Matt. I love the questions coming in, so do keep sending them in. And, and it, it, we never know quite where we're going to go with our conversations because the questions keep pinging in. Matt Carey says, I agree that the COVID situation was unprecedented, but have there been any lasting changes to government and military relationships or command structures? as a result of this partnership? I mean, what have we learned in terms of, of uh, coordination of departments, I suppose he means? Yes, I think that is, the, that is, <clears throat> that is without doubt the biggest lesson. Um, I think what we are learning, and interesting enough, I can't go into the detail, but we're learning it, or, or sorry, we're, we're seeing the benefits in the Ukraine crisis now that 
the um, the creation of something called the National Security Council and the National Security Secretariat, all sits in the Cabinet Office, has meant that um, there is a much better cross Whitehall coordination of activity and planning in response to a crisis. Um, so, for example, um, at the start of the fuel problems back end of last year and the, all the supply chain disruption, we were immediately asked if we could come into, um, I think it was Bayes and Department for Transport, to assist with working out how they could do, how government could do better and the sector could do better um, in, 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 in re-energizing the, the fuel supply chain and the distribution of, of fuel. And I think what is now being seen, <clears throat> excuse me, as we, as we seek to have a whole of government approach to the Ukrainian crisis is that that machinery is now pretty well oiled and, and working well. That's not to say that it isn't, hasn't got areas to improve. I think from a logistics perspective, one of the initiatives I've taken on the back of the COVID crisis is to try and create a cross Whitehall logistics profession so that all logisticians, whether they're in the military, the civil service, in defence or the two other big, big um, uh, communities of logisticians, one's in the foreign office and one's in the department for trade. And sorry, there's a third, which is in the home office, which is border force, is to create them into a single profession with common uh, training skills and experience frameworks so that you can get much greater interoperability between those government departments because one of the things we we found in covid times was we didn't speak the same we're logisticians but we don't speak the same language we we think differently we plan differently by by setting up a profession uh, we've got a better chance of aligning all of that which should bring benefits in terms of the speed of which we can respond to a crisis and then how we then react there's a question from from rajiv gosh i think he's in india um he says, my question is, did you did you coordinate with other countries, military departments while procuring and delivering materials like PPE kits and ventilators? I mean, I suppose most of this stuff came in from China and, and Vietnam, didn't it? The, the, the Far East. What, what, how did that work? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a great question, because I think being brutally honest with everybody, I think in the early days of that crisis, it kind of ended up a little bit every country for itself. Um, there wasn't a lot of collaboration because I think everybody was trying to um, secure their own supplies of, of PPE or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, once things settled down, then the lines of communication between friends and allies and partners picked up uh, and became actually a really helpful um, uh, process and a, a, a helpful forum, if you like, for, 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 for assisting each other. Um, and so um, we would we, we then did the, the Royal Air Force moved PPE and, and ventilators for um, other countries. So I know we did move uh, ventilators and, and oxygen equipment for uh, India at one stage. We also did it for Nepal. Um, so and Brunei, I think, was another one. So there were there were uh, examples of, of that much later on. But in the early days, it, it, it was a little bit like the Wild West um, and, 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 and there wasn't a lot of collaboration, it has to be said. There's um, Peter Njoku, I think I'm pronouncing that name right, says, is it mandatory for all service personnel to be COVID vaccinated? You know, there's, that's the issue in the NHS. And I want to kind of lead on from that after you've answered that is to, you know, when you've got people on submarines underneath the uh, the north pole and the south pole and well you can't go underneath the south pole can you but you can go underneath the north pole um the um, or is it the other way around um the the you've got people on submarines underwater for months on end you've got aircraft carriers like Q, queen elizabeth and we'll come on to talk about that a, a, a bit later but um surely you've got everybody has to be vaccinated and how did you deal with it in the early days when there were no vaccines but you had to you couldn't just go home and in lockdown you had to keep these ships going and these submarines going um how, how did that work so so to answer the first first bit of the question which you, you brought up it's a, it's the north pole you go underneath not the south pole all oh, right thank you <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that that's important to get that one right, right. um 
I think in terms of vaccines, we've not yet, uh, we have not gone to the point of, man, of mandating vaccines, um, but we have strongly um, urged it to be put in place. And I think there are um, other occasions where it is a requirement for deployment into certain operational theatres. So not everybody has to have it, but it is a requirement to deploy into certain operational theatres and in, and in certain operational circumstances so that's the way we've got round it where it is operationally essential or the host nation demands it then we have done it but you know if you're if you're a military person sat in the uk working then there hasn't been any mandated requirement if you were then to deploy on operations you would so if you're operational and deploying yes but not if if, if you're not um but but the question you ask about the um the whole um, how, how did we manage um, COVID in terms of some of our platforms? Yeah, it, that, that, was a, that was one of our biggest concerns. And very early on in the COVID crisis, there were some pretty, um, pretty, clean, uh, pretty sort of strategic conversations which said, right, what are the capabilities that it is absolutely essential that we protect? Um, which parts of the, the military do we have to preserve in order to be able to protect the UK and, and, and security and so on and so forth. So you won't be surprised um, that it was things like uh, the nuclear deterrent. It wasn't, uh, you won't be surprised that it was aircraft defending uh, our, our airspace, what's called the quick reaction aircraft, the typhoons um, based in, in, in various uh, parts of uh, the UK. Um, and so things like that became the, the key part. And it, and, it, and it really came down to a very, very uh, rigid, uh, very tightly controlled um, isolation periods. Um, before a ship or submarine would deploy, they, the crews would go into isolation and they would have no contact with anybody outside of, um, of the crew, except you know, those in, uh, fully masked up in, in PPE, et cetera. Um, of course, then there were no tests at that point very early on um, and that was the only way we could guarantee it um, and to our credit I think we didn't lose any platforms uh, and we didn't have any major outbreaks in those early early days before the testing came in um, but that was the only way we could do it but it was a real fear uh, as, 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 as you can probably imagine that we would end up not being able to complete a mission um, particularly something like the nuclear deterrent, for example, um, with, 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 with people um, uh, with a COVID outbreak. So it was, it was something that we were very, very acutely aware of. Now, Linda Winkler asked a question. This programme, I, I describe it as a bit like Desert Island Discs without the discs. It's, uh, we don't have any music, but we just have the, the uh, people like you talking. Um, Linda says, what, what led you to join the Navy and what do you value about it as a career? <laughs> Tell us about that. Uh, so I suppose the, the, the stimulus to join the Royal Navy were, was, was, was as much about my, well, my grandfather was a, was, a, was a sailor in the Second World War. So he used to regale me with stories of daring do on the high seas um, at, at various stages. So I suppose that's where my uh, initial um, interest was, was peaked. And then I'll be brutally honest, it was, it was the Falklands conflict that probably, as much as anything else, really got me wanting to to join and i wanted to do something very different i i i i, I was looking at other careers and, and and they didn't really appeal i wanted something that was going to be different i come from a part of the part of the country that is that couldn't be further away from uh, the sea if you try if you tried if you triangulate I, I i came almost from the central midlands uh and um uh, and so we didn't have any any maritime <laughs> traditions really uh, in these in, in the Midlands where, where I came up from but if you but but the, but the second half of the question what do I value from it um, I mean I've, I've had the most incredible career so uh, so opportunity is one um, and I and I genuinely think that the Navy is um, uh, you it's a meritocracy you you get on because of who you are and, and what you can do your skills and, and talent not because of where you come from or what school you come from. I, you know, I went to a, a bog standard, all boys comprehensive, um, and then went to, well, I didn't even make it to a poly. I, I went to a college of arts and technology to do my degree. Um, so I didn't go to the right school and I didn't go to the right university, but you can still make 
two, a two star admiral. Um, and so I think that is testament to, to what you can achieve in the Navy. Um, I think we are a, a, we are a diverse organization. I think we've got a lot more to do on our diversity, particularly um, in, in the sense of, of, of gender diversity. But, you know, I'm really proud as the chief naval logistics officer that it's the logistics office, that, that, that it's the logistics branch that has just grown, nurtured and developed the first lady um, rear admiral. Uh, and I think that is that is a really, really seismic moment for for the Navy. And, and, and we are really proud that we've finally got there. We should have got there long ago, but but we are heading in the right direction. A lot more to do. But um, so I so, so I think that's what I would say about the Navy, it, you, 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 the sky is the limit and, and it's down to you as an individual and your talent um, that, that will get you there. Great. Well, we ought to get that lady uh, Rear Admiral on our show, shouldn't we really? That would be really interesting. Yeah. Um, you better give me her details. John Rudd says, uh, would you agree that the military has always been at the cutting edge in medical innovation, especially mer emergency medicine, and also in logistical uh, know-how? And I know, you know, you were out in Afghanistan and uh, there... Uh, particularly at uh, Camp, ba Camp Bastion and so on, there's an enormous hospital. T tell it, well, answer that question and then tell us a little bit about your experiences in Afghanistan. Mm, yeah, sure. Um, so, I, so I think at the moment <clears throat> there is a, a, a real focus on, on technology um, and how we can exploit technology as, as, as we go forward. I think there is a real sense that um, if you can't generate mass, like the US um, or Russia or China, then how do you compensate for that lack of mass? And, and so one of the arguments is that you can, you can compensate for it through, through technology. So way out of my slim la swim lane, but lots and lots of work going into looking at how um, uh, artificial intelligence, automation, machine learning, and so on and so forth uh, can um, generate that competitive edge that you need. Um, so things like un, uh, uh, so, 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 so things like uh, drones and you know what are known as UAVs um, are, are, are a big big uh, area of of, um, of research both on the uh, both in the air but also underwater uh, UAVs. Um, we are also looking in in, in, in in quite a lot of detail at the way in which um, you can use AI to make more informed decisions. And I think the real sense at the moment is, is, is how can we better exploit data, particularly if you're trying to make strategic decisions on resource allocation and investment. Um, so I think, um, and interestingly, I would say that at the moment, whilst in, in the world of medicine, I think you're, you're right, there has been some incredible advances a lot of it driven by um by by war and and conflict and there's no doubt that a a war and a conflict drives a, a far greater um uh, pace of technological change obviously history shows the second world war would be a great case in point but the falkland uh, and the falklands war did as well but if you look at the the advances in it that afghanistan drove um trauma medicine being one um, but also in, in, in the area of counter uh, improvised um, explosive device, the, the, old, the IEDs, um, those just those two areas alone um, during the course of the, the 10 years or so we were in Afghanistan were driven by the operational need. And so there was a real sense <clears throat> in the Ministry of Defence is that if we can do it in war, why can't we do it in peace? And so what we've got to be able to do is break the ceiling, the glass ceiling that has stopped the technological advances moving at the pace they need to move at if you're going to keep up with competitors. Um, and that's things like taking greater risk, um, reducing some of the approvals requirements and the commercial side of things. Um, interestingly enough, I would say that we are, as a, as a military, um, from a logistics perspective, quite a long way off the pace. Um, in, in, from a technological perspective, um, we have tr we have got a big program of work coming on at the moment to try and integrate some sort of what you might call um, sort of cutting edge three PL sort of third party logistics companies like Wincanton, the biggest one in the UK. You know the sort of um, the sort of technology they use for their supply chain 
we are a long way off. But we're getting there. We've got a program. Um, we've got some commercial partners that we're working with to, to help us. Um, but it, but it, but it's the, but it's the thing that is going to dominate. I think the military um, as we go forward. There's a, there's a couple of questions from Shafi Sahili, who was a consultant surgeon in Medway, originally from Afghanistan. So thanks for the help in deployment. I mean, talk us through. You, you were involved, I think, with the the slightly well very chaotic uh, evacuation, weren't you, uh, Andy? Um, not only human beings, but um, uh, a few animals um, got, got on those aeroplanes of yours, I think. T talk us through that. I mean, that must have been pretty stressful for everybody. And, you know, what, any stories from, from that or from your earlier deployment in Afghanistan? Yeah, I, I, I think it was... Um, I, I think the whole way in which it ended, and I don't think um it gives too much away i think we were all hugely saddened um i'm rather disappointed by the way it ended um it was not what i think any of us would would have wanted um i think we were all caught out strategically um by the pace at which things escalated and uh, and 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 um the the sort of profoundness of how it of how it ended um, and I think all of us that have served out there felt, you know, disappointment that that, that we had served um, and supported the Afghan government and the Afghan armed forces. You know, I, I embedded with um, an Afghan unit for, for, for a time out there, got to know some some of the guys very, very well. And, and it, it, yeah, it, it left a little bit of a, 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 a nasty taste in one's mouth. I think the um, but I think the overarching um conclusion that i reached from a military perspective so i was obviously in the ministry of defense doing some of the strategic planning for this was the speed of which we were able to respond once we realized that the the severity of the situation and were were, were, were given the mission um you know the, the 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 service personnel that went out um were in a in a massively difficult set of um, circumstances um, the pressures and the tensions and the threat was, were huge. Um, the humanitarian situation they were faced with, um, the human misery, if I may use that word, was, was, you know, having spoken to some of them was overwhelming. They, they wanted to help everybody, but they couldn't. And that is going to affect people. I think there will be a lot of people that, well, I know, have come back and have found that a really difficult um, experience to um to deal with um because they were faced with with an almost um you know they could it was almost a, a um one of the you couldn't win um you could only take out so many people against certain criteria and there were just so many other people that wanted our help and we just couldn't do it but i think the the, the bravery the fortitude and the humanity um exhibited by our people out there um, and um, the way in which they conducted themselves was immense, and I think we should all be very proud of them. There's a good question here from Lucy Fraunfelder. Thank you, Lucy. As a naval logistician, uh, logistician, am I saying that right? Um, with such a long and varied career, you've seen significant. You must have seen significant changes, cultural, organisational, especially during crisis management. What advice would you have to leaders? managing change especially for their personnel i mean I, we could broaden that out into into leadership because i mean medicine you know leadership is terribly important in the teams that we have in medicine but that has changed a lot over certainly my career um what's happening in the navy and what could what could medicine learn from the way that the military organized leadership and, ma and the management of change as lucy asks yeah that's a that's a big big question um and I think it's 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 a, it's a, it's a very very pertinent one, given you know there's been a lot of questions of um, of um, about leadership in in various sectors over the last twelve months or so, I guess. Um, so I think, how would I describe it? So leadership in the military um, isn't is is something that is is nurtured and developed, and 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 we are taught how to be leaders but at the end of the day there is enough scope and enough flexibility for you to be the type of leader you want to be we're not automatons so i don't think i've ever met two leaders that are the same um, i've met some leaders that are very cerebral 
I've met and, and they think through the problem and they've done a lot of reading and they they like to weigh everything up. And I've met on the on the other side, many leaders who are who are instinctive, um, go with their gut and um, are, are much more sort of um, proactive in, in, in that way. Um, I think in, in, for, for us that there, there is a, uh, you know, we are a pyramid organization. We, 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 you know, people talk about flattening hierarchies. Um, when you're on operation, there's only so much flattening you can do um, because at the end of the day, um, somebody has to take the decisions. Somebody has to be accountable and somebody has to own the responsibility and the risk particularly risk to life and your people, your given um, men, women um, from the three armed forces and the civil servant, civil service, and they're your responsibility. And if you're going to put them in harm's way, then you better be bloody sure you're doing it for the right reason and that you understand the risks and you've mitigated them where you can. Now, risk, it, I think, is a massive part of being a leader um, because you can't be a leader and not take risk but your risk tolerance is, is what makes the, the leadership that you exhibit and your results are judged judge through it, I, I would argue. But, you know, equally, uh, whilst that sounds awfully autocratic, it, it, in phases of an operation, there is, there is no truck. You know, the leader is the leader um, and, and it, it, it's, it's their decisions. But underneath that, you've got to create that... that um, environment if you like of of trust um and mutual respect and support and so i think there are there's probably two um tenets of leadership that i you know really really put great store by if you put you know if you accept risk as being a, a sort of a function one is the ability to challenge um and the other is is enablement uh, you know enabling um your your people um, and 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 giving them the, the the freedoms to make the decisions that they need to make. But there's quite often, I think, a a difficult balance when you when you are empowering people. Empowering is a better word than enablement. When you are empowering people, you can't just say, right, that's your responsibility. Get on with it. You've got to. Ha there's almost got to be a bit of a. Um, there's got to be a bit of a trade deal. There's got to be a bit of a negotiation here. You've got to know what what you will allow, what you won't allow. And you've also got to make sure that the, ind the individual understands what you're asking them to do and that they've got the skills and competencies and training to do it. Um, so that's so that's a really important part, I would say. The other one is, is this this concept of, of challenge. Um, and I think it's it's something that is really, really important because up to the point at which the commander says, right, we're going left. Um, let's go up to that point challenge is a really really important point thing because that's the way in which you get out of the group think that's the way you can get out of um autocratic dictatorial um leadership which which is which is no use to no use to anybody um so that ability to inculcate in your staff and your people the willingness to challenge and be challenged back because i think that's important um, but also to understand the way to challenge and how to challenge is really important. To come on to the final part of that question, though, um, that was posed, which is about the, the, the management of change. Um, I've seen good management of change and I've seen appalling management of change. Um, the Ministry of Defence, probably like the NHS, has been through perpetual programmes of change. We never seem to stop changing um, and never seem to um, have time to just let change settle before we're off again on something else. I think those that are good at change um, are, are those leaders that have a very clear vision of what they want to get after, what they want to achieve, are open, honest and transparent, and that they, they, they listen. Again, it comes back to this challenge piece and that they take the people that are being changed with them. You, change has got, I think change has got to be, part, you've got to be part of change. You can't have change done to you because if you have change done to you, the first thing as a human, I think, is you go, not interested, you know, what do you know? You're, you're just mucking up my life. But if you can explain your vision, explain the benefits, explain why you need to change. And that's often, I think, where people go wrong is they don't 
explain, well, why do we have to change? Well, you know, and if you can't, as a leader, say the reasons we need to change are the following, then you shouldn't be changing in the first place and you shouldn't be leading it. Um, but it, you've got to take your people with you. You've got to make them part of the solution and help and, and, and make them feel as if they um, are shaping and influencing and that they're being listened to. Um, where it goes wrong is the antithesis of all of that when you've got people who are just, you know, driving it forward um, with no real concept of, 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 of how and when and in what way they can, they can integrate their people. Got it. Okay. Um, the the you mentioned the word risk, and of course, training uh, for you guys involves taking risk. And I, I think when we were talking ahead of this program, you know, you, you to get really good as a as a military guy, you have to train as you fight. But that involves yeah. taking uh, some risk. So talk about that, and, and tell me about during your training, you had a life threatening. Um, uh, accident didn't you just tell, tell us about that and then we'll get back to some people's questions uh yes so i think um absolutely would 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 agree with what you just said about train train as you fight um there is a, a a sense that if you can train hard you can fight easy that's an americanism um and there's there's a lot of truth in all of that um you have to make your training as realistic as you can but at the same time, you can't do that in a reckless way. You've got to be cognizant of the risks. You've got to put in the right levels of, um, of, of, of health protection, um, medical protection, um, the right constraints on, um, on, on, on taking risks. Um, you know, there's been countless um, examples where those boundaries have, been, have not been clear and not been understood and not well managed. Again, I think it comes back to leadership, leadership of training. It's, um, I think sometimes people, oh, it's just training. No, that's not the way you should do it. You know, training is, is A, important because that's the only way we as an individual and an organization and as a team can improve our performance and be ready for a crisis. Um, but, it, but equally, it's massively important that people are looked after. My personal, um, uh, story that you just you, you just alluded to was was when I was doing submarine training many many years ago um, those in the know will sit there and go ah but he's not wearing dolphins um, I didn't complete my submarine training and therefore didn't become a submariner and get to wear the dolphins um, because I was in the what's called the, what was then called the submarine escape tank trainer which was known as set s-e-w double t um, which is a big column 30 meter column of water um, and into which you are taught the principles of ascending um, in a, a column of water um, without any breathing apparatus, you know, con constantly breathing out. And if you do it properly, I think the theory is that your lungs will never empty because the last bit of air will then expand and expand and up, up you'll go. Um, that's great all in principle, except um, me as 23 year old know-it-all at some point held his breath. Uh, and got a, a double pulmonary neurothorax and a cerebral gas embolism, which uh, very nearly ended my life. It certainly ended my submarine career. But um, yeah, but that just goes to show you the kind of risks there are. Interesting enough, not that many years later, we stopped doing submarine escape tank training because the risks were one of the reasons. There were others, but one of the reasons was because the risks were so great to people that were that were doing the um, that doing the training. <laughs> it's a good story. I've got a nice question, and this is a good question from uh, Luned Lewis. She said, you mentioned the first woman rear admiral, but the Royal Navy still has a way to go in terms of providing women with clothing and equipment that actually fit. Women are not small men. Uh, is providing appropriate clothing and equipment now becoming a priority for the Royal Navy? And could you explain how, please? Yes. Um, <laughs> so you are absolutely right. Um, we have not been... Uh, we've not been we have we have not covered ourselves in glory in that aspect at all um it has been something we should have got sorted a while ago um and properly produce um uh, uh, tailored clothing to fit all um all, all types of uh, of people and, and body sizes you know there's there's we, we, the, we, the, we, there's there's lots of evidence that we should have we, we should have moved on some time ago um but that has now been acknowledged um, there is quite a significant program of work uh, being led. Um, you know, importantly, um, who should lead that program of work? Well, a woman should lead that program of work. 
historically men had led that program of work. Comes back to my point about can we do better from a diversity perspective? Yes, we can. It's being led by a very, uh, very capable officer who um, is pulling together all of the um, the market research, if you like, of what women would want in uh, clothing. So that, as you rightly say, um, it's not just a small man's clothing, which 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 is which is not what we're after. So. Um, that is, is being, in fact, the second or the first sea lord, I can't remember who it was, one of the two wrote out very recently to reassure people that this message had got through uh, and that it was being addressed. So over the next few months or so, we will see the contracts being changed and new lines of clothing uh, for women will come on. So Peter Njuku, thanks Peter, says, join the Navy to see the world. The Navy can be the military wing of the Foreign Office. How true is this? And are there any friendship visits to Africa by you? Um, so I think that's, 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 a very, um, that's a very perceptive comment um, because um, the Royal Navy is probably more than all three services, but, but all three would, would, would say they play a role, role in it. Um, what we end up doing in terms of engagement overseas is done to meet government policy. Um, so, you know, the days of an independent Navy sailing around places because they fancy it um, are long, long gone, as, 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 as I think we would all hope and expect. And so we are very careful now <clears throat> that what we do in terms of activity, whether that's deployments, exercises, training or anything like that, is completely aligned with what the Foreign Office wants um, in terms of building relationships, security. Uh, diplomacy, prosperity, uh, and and the rule of law. So, the carrier strike group deployment of of last year with the with with HMS Queen Elizabeth was was absolutely aligned with that um, with that agenda. And so, if you look at where the carrier strike group went, it was all about supporting global Britain. And so, yeah, there there, there isn't a there isn't a, a chink of light between what the uh, the foreign office wants and what what the military delivers it, it has to be otherwise that the, the there's just incoherence and 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 you 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 you're wasting money effectively um and and africa obviously is 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 a significant part of that um agenda and i think um we've got um a number of of, of areas of of uh, west africa being one i think our friends in nigeria ghana and, and so on and so forth and then Kenya uh, and uh, places like Botswana on, on the East Coast are always areas where the Royal Navy has had a presence. Um, I've had many great visits to, to all of those uh, locations in the past, and I think that will continue. Um, I think there is an intent to try and have a permanently based vessel in West Africa. Um, and I think this whole question of persist, what's called persistent engagement, which is where we you know, have our ships um, but also our, our land units and our aircraft um, visiting, but also training and, 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 and being in these particular areas with our friends and partners is, what, is something that this government is very, very keen on. And that is part of the strategy that they, they signed off last year. <clears throat> so many questions coming through. I can't ask. I won't have time to ask them all, but thank you anyway. Um, Ed Nichols says hello, but he also says, if the Chancellor called you in the MOD tomorrow and says his budgeting has been wrong and he's got a large amount of surplus funds, where would you suggest that he use it? <laughs> I doubt that's ever going to happen. Uh, <laughs> you never know, you never know. No, you never, no, you never know. No, um, yeah, uh, never say never, as they, as they say. Where would I spend all that money? Um, I, would, I would, well, as a logistician, you would expect me to say I, I, would, I would invest in enablement for starters. Um, in, in all kinds of different ways. I think it is, I think historically, it's fair to say that uh, enablement, logistic enablement, medical enablement, engineering enablement is quite often the poor cousin um, because to some extent, it's not, it's not photogenic. Um, so you can't, you can't have your photo taken in front of a, uh, of, a, of a whole load of spares or stores or fuel or, or weapons or whatever it might be. Um, you know, you can in front of a ship or a tank or a, an aircraft. Um, and I think we could spend, I think a lot more money spent on enablement would be, would, would give us much more resilience for things like a COVID pandemic. 
Um, but I think it would also give us the reach and endurance that that, that we need. I think I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would also spend money on ensuring that our um, accommodation for all our people is as good as it possibly can be. I think that would be a, a, a second area. I'm going to I'm going to avoid saying I'd give us all a pay rise because that's not uh, that's not that's not the place to go. So I think the third area I would probably go and spend money on because I'm a sailor is I would spend it on on more ships, um, not necessarily high end capabilities. You do need those. But the sort of middle to lower end capabilities comes back to the question about foreign office um, agendas um, and persistent engagement and that diplomatic security prosperity uh, function where um, you could quite easily get enormous return on your investment with another half a dozen uh, sort of Corvette, small frigate type ships. They are being built, but I think you could quite easily build another, you know, half a dozen of them and get and get some great investment return. Okay, so this is a topical question. Peter Wisniewski <coughs> says, logistically, is this a logical time for a Russian attack uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine? Is it still winter? I mean, you don't have to answer that if, you, if it's too sensitive, but, but it's a good question because, you know, traditionally these, these wars take place in the summer, don't they? What do you think? Yeah, um, so I do need to be slightly careful um, and not step into the realms of, of, of secret um, um, activity. Um, but if I sort of answer it generically, that's probably the easiest thing. I mean, I think, you know, environmental conditions are always at the heart of any operational commander's decision uh, or, 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 or military commander's decision uh, on what, what one would want, wish to do. Um, <clears throat> history um, tells us that if you um, embark on a military adventure or a military venture, I should say, Freudian slip, um, in the, at the wrong time of year, then you have difficulties. Napoleon and Hitler both saw that when they invaded Russia. Um, I know that the challenges during the Falklands conflict of ensuring that they could get their way through the Falklands winter um, were massively important. Um, we had um, all kinds of um, environmental challenges in Afghanistan. So there was always something called the fighting season in Afghanistan, which was the period of, so there was a period of time when even the Taliban decided that it was too hot to fight um, and there were other things that they could be doing. And so there was always this lull, not stop, but lull in the fighting in, in, in Afghanistan. So I think any, any military commander needs to pay um, due attention to the environmental and climatic uh, conditions um, before they embark on any military activity. Um, and I think, you know, sticking with the sort of... Um, uh, stuff that is that is that is in the news now of course climatic change um, is going to make that even more acute in terms of a challenge um, as we have to deal with even even more sort of severe weather events uh, flooding and, and desertization things like that yeah and storms at sea i suppose pia ingers uh, says are we prepared to meet uh, future cyber war staff wise and education wise there are a couple of, of questions actually about to cyber war and whether the the logistic side of it is is up to the challenge what do you think yes it it's funny enough um it's been unsurprisingly an area of conversation recently and again be slightly careful of classifications and stuff but i suppose there's two points i would make the first is um the government back last year absolutely recognized the centrality of 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 cyber defense and the national cyber force that was that was created last year is is at the heart of that um i think we are constantly in in that space of needing to educate people because our people are frequently the the, the achilles heel and the soft underbelly if you like of, of any organization um so making sure that we train our people to be cyber aware to um know what a what a um suspect email might look like what the what the actions they should take might be in terms of phishing emails and reporting it and 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 not clicking on links and all the things which equally apply to us all in our own personal lives and, and you know we, we're, we're as at risk as anybody else and so we are i think gradually but but steadily i suppose is a better way of describing it getting after that training 
and those skills and competencies. I think the other thing from a logistics perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, is to actually understand what, so, so the terminology is a degraded environment might look like and how might you operate and fight in that sense? Because I think it's, it's, it's a fallacy to think that you might avoid um, disruption or, or, or loss of systems or loss of capability. Um, you will. And, 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 you know, it was in open source only 48 hours ago that, rushed, that there was a, a, a cyber attack on, on, on Ukrainian systems. Um, in any future conflict, I think it is almost a given that there will be some form of cyber uh, angle to, to, that, to, that, to that operation, to that mission. And therefore, what we're trying to do is, is, is develop and understand how one might um, fight through that. What, what's, what's, the, what's your resilience? What's your fallback nodes? Um, comes back to the question was quite right about skills and training and competencies. We need to train our service person, service personnel to be able to, uh, to, to a, know when there is a, a, a situation like that, but then how they're going to respond. And, and if you lose all your, your, your networks for 24, 48 hours, how do you continue to deliver outputs? How do you continue to carry on? Does it matter? Can you lose them for 48 hours or so and so forth? So, um, yeah, it's a massively important area which we're um, putting a lot of effort into. Andy, the, the, we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to be really quick now. I've um, got a question from Germany. Um, you know, the, the, this, these broadcasts go out all, out all over the world. So Professor Mark Baron von Ostov in Germany says, a question from a German wheelchair user. I know in, that inclusion of disabled people is more self-evident in Great Britain than here in Germany. Are there people in the military with uh, birth disabilities? Uh, and, and are they catered for? I mean... That's an interesting question. Yes, it is. And I, so out of my area of, 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 of deep knowledge, but um, what, I can, what I can say is um, we're doing a lot of work to understand how we can create the necessary, safe, inclusive working environments for as many, for, for everyone. Um, now, there are clearly some scenarios and some environments that we, that we operate in that will be restrictive and, and, and therefore um, won't be um, suitable for everybody. But um, we are absolutely committed to where we can opening up those, those opportunities for, for as many people as we possibly can. It is the military and therefore there will always be constraints on that. But, I, but as a principle, that, that is absolutely at the heart of what we, uh, what we believe in. Okay, so this is the last question really. Um... Well, no, actually, last but one uh, penultimate question from James Gilchrist. Thank, thank you, James. How does the Navy support the integrity of family life? And, and th that question extends to you. I know you've got two daughters, um, neither of which are in the Navy. But how does the Navy support family life? Because you guys are out on the, well, you, you're not, you're in the MOD, but you're out on, on, away from home a lot. So yeah. any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, it, 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 it is difficult. And, and yeah, from a personal perspective, it has always been, it, 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 it's been a hard, hard being away. COVID crisis, we were, I was deployed in London on my own for four months. You know, so it, to, it, no matter where you are, you, you, you always, your family life will always take a hit. And we're really conscious of that, particularly for, um, for, for, for service personnel that have got young children. Um, we are really acutely aware of, of, of single parents um, because those are often the, the reasons people cite for leaving. And one of the reasons why we've not done as well as we should have done on, on, on gender diversity, for example, is because of those reasons. We've not been flexible. We've not given people the, the, um, the, the tools and the conditions to, to be able to do it, uh, to, 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 to be able to blend a family life and a military life. It isn't for everybody and it doesn't work for everybody, but what we're now able to do is give people sabbaticals. We now give paternity and maternity leave. Um, we try and um, give people much more certainty in the programming, programming of ships, because if there is one thing that will screw up a family life, it is a no notice change. It is, you know, you, you, you and your family are planning a, 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 the next three months and all of a sudden it's torn up because of, um, of, of a change to program now there's always operational reasons why you can't get away from it but importantly we have got to put greater stability in our programming that 
plus those other factors um, will, will, I think, make family life more tolerable. But you can't get away from the fact that if you're joining the Royal Navy, you are joining a service that involves dislocation and separation. You can compensate for it, but it is always there. Um, and it is sometimes, um, there's a horrible, horrible phrase of life in a blue suit. Um, and sometimes the service needs overrides everything else. Yeah, good, good answer. Okay, last question <clears throat> of all. But we, we heard about how you nearly died in that submarine training um, uh, tunnel. Um, what's your proudest moment, Andy? Looking back, what are you most um, proud of? Yes, so um, professionally was getting the CB for um, everything I'd done in support of uh, the COVID. Uh, pandemic and uh, going to Windsor Castle and getting my 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 honour from Prince William. That was that was that was very 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 Good very man. special. Congratulations so was, from all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So that was that was professional. And I think in my personal life, it's it's my two daughters who I am immensely proud of um, fighting through those separations that we were just talking about. Graduating. What are they, what are they the called? Give them a plug. What so it's Miranda called? and Felicity. Oh, well done, Miranda and Felicity. Okay, <laughs> good. They can watch the video if they're not watching their dad now. Exactly. Very good. Andy, we better go because it's uh, just, what is it? It's two minutes past eight, so I'm already two minutes over time. Thank you so much for taking uh, part in this. Really appreciate it. We've answered about 15 questions, but there are at least 25 or more than that. I've just got to make a, a, a few announcements about other things coming up. So tomorrow, we've got a very influential... Uh, expert on COVID, Martin McKee, at 12.30, so do uh, tune in for that. Uh, our next In Conversation Live is uh, Fraser Nelson, uh, editor of The Expectator, talking to Simon Wesley, our, uh, my former president uh, of the RSM, 2nd of March. And then on the 17th of March, we've got a really interesting program on assisted dying, controversial topic. You know, doctors have very differing views on that. We're going to debate uh, that issue. Uh, we're going to try to make it not too controversial and too argumentative, but it will be interesting. And then uh, uh, later in, uh, in March, we're coming up to our 100th episode of uh, COVID-19. And uh, that's going to be an extended episode. We're having Chris Whitty. We're having um, nearly all our top speakers, the top people in the country who've dealt medically with uh, the COVID crisis. So do uh, tune in for that. You can, if you go to RSM Live, you'll be able to register for that. And uh, we'd love to see you. Uh, remember, it's, this is free for you, but it's not free for the RSM. So if you're feeling generous, and we have any plutocrats out there or even just ordinary people that like to make a donation to the RSM, they would be gratefully received. But talking of gratitude, Andy, thank you so much. I really love talking to you. So interesting. I'm sorry we didn't ask, get to ask all those questions, but uh, you gave a great uh, talk to us. So thanks very much and good thanks, night, everybody. Good night. Bye.